Welcome everybody to Prep Doctors. Welcome to a special night dedicated to the AFK exam. My name is Othman Quick. I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager here at Prep Doctors. Tonight I'm delighted to be joined by our co-founder and Chief Learning Officer, Dr. Marwan Al Reyes, and one of our senior AFK instructors, Dr. Ibrahim Sadaldin. Welcome, doctors. Thank you for joining us. So to begin tonight, I, I, I just wonder if you could give uh, a summary, and maybe we'll start with you, Dr. Marwan. What exactly is the AFK exam? Okay, so first of all, welcome everyone to the session. Uh, it's a good question. What is the AFK exam? It's uh, pretty much four or five years of dentistry being examined in one day in 200 multiple choice questions that are randomly selected, um, not, I wouldn't say, equally weighed based on disciplines, which makes this exam actually uh, a tough exam to predict. So what does that mean? When you go through five years of dentistry, you're gonna study all kind of topics, prosto, perio, pharma, and so forth. When you go to the exam, uh, based on the feedback we get from candidates, you never know which topic is gonna be weighed the most, which means that if you were focusing on some topics more than others, you may luck out or you may get pretty much disadvantaged. It's tough in the sense that you have to review everything. They do get to uh, a very specific level. They're very detail-oriented questions. Um, and it's the entry to the equivalency process, whether you're gonna proceed with the direct route or the indirect route. That's the, the entry-level exam. Now, recently, uh, one, first of all, one university switched to the ADAT. They replaced AFK with ADAT which is McGill, and then University of Toronto followed, but now University of Toronto, they reverted back to AFK. So still AFK is the most important exam that's gonna be uh, utilized by universities to select candidates for their equivalency uh, program. And also, it is the exam that will grant you entry into the indirect route, the second phase, which is ACJ. Um, I consider this exam to be the most important in the sense if, unfortunately, you end up exhausting your attempts, uh, pretty much the future of dentistry in Canada is closed except for one university, which is McGill, because McGill, they don't rely on it. And your option is gonna be now, you have to navigate around it, meaning you end up going to Australia or Ireland or US and come back afterwards. So that's why um, this exam has to be taken very seriously and that's why we have the session today so people, they can understand the nature of this exam and the importance of this exam uh, for their uh, career in Canada. Dr. Brian. Welcome, everyone. So, um, so, I, so the AFK exam. So the AFK, as you guys know, is the assessment of fundamental knowledge. It does examine you in a lot of topics. So that's, that's the main problem with this exam that uh, there's not a certain topic that you have to study for and that's it. So it does examine you on a lot of topic and there's a big wide, uh, uh, let's say, uh, spectrum that you have to cover. Um, another problem with the AFK exam, I'll just gonna list some problems and then we'll see how we can deal with them. Another problem with the AFK exam is that um, there isn't a clear guideline or uh, way to tell you what are the questions that are going to come in the exam except for what they bring in their website which are the release questions. As you guys know the uh, NDEB releases questions, they used to release questions every year, they didn't release questions since 2019. Since 2019 they didn't release any questions. They have been releasing questions since 2010. The questions are redundant, some questions are not correct, some questions are good. So, and the bigger problem is that they don't provide the answers for these questions, which is, doesn't make sense, right? So that's, that's the only way that the NDEB provides you to prepare for the exam, plus 
the references. So they do provide you with a list of references, which is in their website. You can go in, there is a list of around 140 textbooks. So actual textbooks, big, big textbooks. So uh, this is what you need to do basically. Go over 140 textbooks, study them very well, and then hope for the best. The other side is there is 140 textbooks, but when you actually question them on certain things, they tell you, well, we base it on our universities over here. Yeah. And you have no access to their universities neither, so that's another side of the, the challenge. So, yeah, so it becomes difficult. And this, this brings us to another question I'll maybe just jump over. So how can we deal with this? How can we deal with this exam? And what is the best approach to actually deal with this exam? And the best approach is to study or to go over these 140, or at least a selective few of these references, plus going through the released questions and answering them and making sure that your answers are correct. And this takes a lot of time, right? This takes a lot of time. This takes um, at least at least 10 to 12 months of eight hours, 10 hours of studying to do that, right? And hopefully this is what we provide. So hopefully this is what prep doctors provide. So what we do is that we have done the research for you. So we did the research. We looked through the textbooks. We looked through the questions. We answered the questions. We tried to summarize the important information in the books that you are provided with. We tried to include as much as information that we have. Because the problem with, we, after you finish AFK, a lot of people, uh, from our experience, a lot of people who take our courses, not because they talk of course, but a lot of people, they do go through this exam and they do pass the exam. And you'll see examples today. Um, and my point is that um, it's very difficult to do it on your own. It is doable. A lot of people do do the AFK exam on their own, but you need a lot of uh, free time. And um, a lot of people don't have that free time, right? A lot of people who are coming here to Canada, they have to work while they are studying. They have families they have to take care of. So that's not something that you can do uh, while managing everything else in your life. So this is what we try to do. We try to provide you with the information that are necessary for you to uh, have a chance in passing this exam, actually have a very good chance in passing this exam. And um, we try to do this every cycle, and we try to improve it every cycle, and we try to add to it every cycle. So, uh, yeah. Uh, what are the key features um, of our course that we've created in order to make it easier for people to pass? Okay, so the, the first thing what I will just add on to what Dr. Uh, Ibrahim was talking about is the 140 books, we made them how many books? I would say like uh, 25 or something 25 like that, but yeah, in terms of, so we, we summarized the books into smaller booklets, which still a lot of candidates feel there's a lot of material in them, but they are based on the most, I would say, uh, tested concepts that are actually um, taught in university in Canada. So for example, I graduated from University of Toronto so we have an idea on what actually they like and what they focus on in their exams. And since they started doing their exams, the concepts have not changed, meaning the topics they actually test you on, they're gonna be the same topics, and that will narrow down the spectrum into um, a number of booklets that you need to look at and study. So the, the first feature is we do have thorough lectures that covers all the topics, and on the most probable topics that will show up in the exam. Now, of course, I'm not gonna say we can guarantee you that 100% of the questions we're gonna cover, but which is impossible because of the spectrum, but I can with confidence say that we will be able to cover 90% at least of the questions that actually come in the exam, if not more. And that's more than enough to actually not only pass the exam, but even pass it with a high score. Now the other feature, the, the features we included in the course is we have lectures, we also have a platform that uh, you can utilize and access from home to practice yourself after you take the topic, so you make sure that you understood the concepts. Lately we added um, a replay feature, so we have our computer lab 
So if you attended our lectures and you feel, okay, I didn't get this material, it was too fast, or I have graduated a long time ago, and uh, I can comprehend this material so quickly, I need to watch it two, three times, you can book the slot, watch the lecture over and over again, and take your own notes at your own pace. And that we saw when we implemented this feature, it actually contributed significantly to increasing the passing rate even further than what we had before, because now you don't only hear the lecture once, you can hear it as many times as you want. Um, also, we included the, the quizzes and practice sessions during the course, and this is more for motivation, so that you don't slack off. You, we, we remind you that you're not studying, because a lot of times when you take the material, you think you're studying, you skim through it. When you take the quiz, it's reality check that have you actually studied or not. Your score will speak out very clearly whether you have been studying or not. So that's another feature that we have in this course. We also have a question answer sessions towards the end of the course. So that's when people start to get most serious is the last month of lectures. They start to realize, oh, the exam is coming close. We have to get even more serious. So more questions start to come up. So we arrange for those sessions and we conclude the course with mock exams in order to, for you to assess yourself and for us to be able to assess you and provide a recommendation, whether you're ready or not for the exam. So that's just a, a quick overview. Anything to add, Dr. Ibrahim? Or? Um, so, um, so I'm gonna add something is, um, so the way that we actually try to construct the course, the course, if, we, if I remember, it was, two days and only lectures maybe six years ago something and then we started adding we realized that people would benefit from another day uh, so we can add more information and then we realized that people would benefit from questions questions are very good for people to practice so quizzes that we implemented uh, practice sessions that we implemented these are very very important first of all to give you a reality check Second of all, to make you understand, and a lot, of th a lot of the struggle that people have is with reading questions. People don't know how to deal with questions and don't know how to read questions. And practicing questions is one of the very important things, and this is what we try to provide with these continuous quizzes. Each quiz you'll have around 40 to 50 questions, and this is gonna be for almost every topic. So you will have a very big bank of questions at the end of the course that you can examine yourself. You will have expo you will have uh, already exposure to questions, and that's very important because uh, people who know how to deal with the question in the exam will have a very high probability to actually pass the exam if they had, of course, the proper knowledge before the, lec the lectures, the information, the resources, uh, and, and so on. So um, um, I believe that this type of structure for you to have the information readily available in the form of lectures, in the form of textbooks, in the form of replays, and to be able to test yourself in the form of quizzes, and then at the end in the form of a mock exam. A lot of people pay attention only to the mock exams. The mock exams are very important. They uh, examine you, they put you a lot of, in, on, under a lot of stress, but at the same point, they are very educational. They add to your information. So I believe that we're trying to, like, I don't know, to complete the image by, uh, throughout this course, for you to have, as at the end, a passing grade, right? So that's, that's our hope, that everyone goes through this process as smooth as possible and uh, for people to pass this exam. So that's our genuine hope, and this is what we're trying to do. Fantastic, so I, I wanna open up the floor for questions now. So what I tell the candidate is, you should not be appearing for the second time until you answer a question to yourself, why did you not pass the first time? And you have to be also not biased because what usually happens to candidates, unfortunately, who go through a failure, it's a very traumatic experience. And that traumatic experience is very tough to handle sometimes. And then you start to look for answers and usually the answers become because you have put effort. It is not that you did not put the effort, you have put the effort and you feel that there is something that's, you did everything you can 
and there's something else missing outside. So people start fishing for that. So the first question is, you have to reflect back, how did you study? Did you actually know the material? Sometimes I even run an exercise uh, with some candidates, which I bring them to the room when they say, and I say, okay, do you think you know the material? They say, yes, we have read the material and we have studied. So I say, okay, have you actually studied the material? Do you believe you studied the material? They say, yes, we studied the material. That's like right after the results come out. I say, okay, if I ask you a question from the material, do you think you know this? And then they realize when I actually ask them questions through the material, the material, every time the question is asked, they vaguely remember it. They know it's in the material, but they can't provide the exact answer. And usually these people, when they go through the exam, this is exactly what they say. They say that when we see the question, we recognize that we came across this piece of information. After we exit the exam, we know exactly where to go and look for the answer for this piece of information, but we couldn't collect it, recollect, um, to have that recollection. And that usually results, to be honest with you, when I speak to these candidates, is the lack of a pure attention and distraction in their lifestyle. Because a lot of these candidates that I usually talk to, they e either have family, they're working part-time job. So when I ask them about their study habit, they say, oh, we were studying and we had two kids to supervise at the same time, for example. Or we were studying and I have to be back home at seven every day because I have, I, I'm doing this split with my husband or I have commitments. So what happens is, although you're putting the time, you don't have that pure focus for the exam. And for the candidates like that, the main thing that you have to uh, do is when you actually study for the material, uh, what I tell people, if you can't prove yourself in our mocks, don't expect you're gonna prove yourself in the exam. It's gonna be very unlikely unless, unless, by coincidence, the concepts that come in the exam are very close to some concepts that, not the concepts, the questions that come in the exam are close to what we actually predicted. Some people, they luck out in some cycles. But what we tell people is don't be, uh, uh, don't put yourself in a position where you're memorizing answers. You have to actually put yourself in a position where you know the concepts. And of course, there are techniques we teach people when we do the question. And I do it in every discussion. When I put the question, they answer it correctly. I tell them, okay, this is only 10% of success if you answer the question correctly. How do you know you're ready? You know you are ready for the exam if you can tell me why this is correct and you can tell me why the other three options are incorrect. And what will make the other three options correct? If you can handle this much of explanation, then you're ready. By just recognizing the answer is not ready. So what I would recommend is First, first thing you should do is test yourself. And when you test yourself, do this random test. You have to do it yourself. So pick up the material, do the exams. You have to do it topic by topic to find out where's your weaknesses. And then you're gonna focus on that. And after you do that, you have to change the approach you're actually studying. Because it's clearly, uh, if you don't clear the exam, it is a failure, you did something wrong. Okay, it's not like you didn't do something wrong. And most likely, it's not that you didn't want to study, it's not that you didn't study, it's the way you were studying. So to, to finalize things, what I tell people is, it is much better to know, and I use this example, I tell them it is much better to know 40%, 100%, than to know 100%, 40%. What does that mean? If you don't have, it's much better to know 40% of the material so well that you can remember it exactly how it is, then to actually read the entire material and you vaguely remember the entire material. So uh, since you brought up the crash course, let, let's talk about the intention of the crash course, okay? Because uh, we have the full course here on site. The crash course was not intended for people who can attend the full course. The crash course was intended for people who cannot attend the full course due to circumstances such as they are out of the country, they are still international, they, uh, they're out of province in a province that we don't have a location. 
so that they can actually have some guidance. I wouldn't say 100% guidance, and we don't advertise it as 100% guidance. We just tell them you can have some guidance so they don't gamble with the first attempt. Because a lot of these people internationally, they gamble. They have no guidance, so they come, they say, we're gonna just take a chance. We'll do the exam, and they waste an attempt. So if you're here, I don't recommend the crash course. And the other thing is, although we try our best to put the updates in the crash course, but it's tough sometimes to cover everything. And the third aspect of your question is you, yourself, and your personality. This is how I answer this question. I tell people, are you the kind of person who gets motivated by group, or are you the kind of person who likes to study by themselves? Now, if you are the kind of person who likes to study by themselves, and you have our material, then it makes more sense that you don't come for the course, but you spend those three days actually studying. But if you're not gonna come for the course and you're not gonna study by yourself, then it's a problem. Okay, so you have to figure out what type of person you are for this aspect. There is two possibilities here, and I've seen it in people who do that. Either they are ready, because they've seen the material, they come, they feel good, then they advance, or they panic. Because the mocks exam, they come at the end of the course, so they don't come at a time where you actually have time to recover if something is, was done wrong. So, that's, so to answer your question in a simple, in simple way, do you know what you did wrong in the past? If you know, just fix it. You don't need to take a course again and come for the mock exams. It, it, yeah, like the simplest answer, it depends, but uh, on the circumstances, uh, how many hours to devote if, and how many months are they devoting as well? Because if they're studying for 10 months, they need less hours per day as if they're studying for four months. But usually, uh, if, and I think the best one, let, let's uh, direct this question to Dr. Yash, who's a top scorer. How many hours did you study to get your top score? Uh, I just followed what Dr. Mavan said always. <laughs> but to be honest, uh, it was more about uh, having everything else as secondary and putting your study as a priority. It's like in 24 hours, even if you give eight hours a day, it's just one quarter of 24 hours. So minimum of eight hours if you really want to get into it. After all, as Dr. Marwan keeps saying that, it's about the depth of the knowledge instead of anything else. So it takes a lot of effort. You have to study hard, very hard. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I heard also some people, they even go above the eight hours. They say we go in the morning to the library and we leave at night. So uh, people who actually score well. And um, some people, they say, well, I can only afford four hours to study. I'm like, okay, if it's four hours, then it's not gonna be over five months. It's gonna be over 10 months. So you just have to respect that. You have to respect that you're gonna put time. You studied how many, this material, how long did it take you to study in school? Five years, right? You're doing it in four or five months. It's the same spectrum of material. So you have to put the time. So um, I'll answer this briefly, then Dr. Ibrahim, you can elaborate on that. I tell people you have to pass all of our mocks before you go for the third attempt, all of them. That's not the same criteria for someone in the second or the first attempt. Because we do have people who pass AFK with even good scores, even by scoring 60 in our exams. But when it comes to the third, we, we can't gamble with that one because it's the last chance. So you have to prove yourself here. It's a very tough situation. So for uh, anyone who is on the third attempt, it means that he did the exam twice and they didn't pass. So it depends. I believe it depends on how much did you score. If you scored close to the passing grade in both attempts, then you do have a good chance in the third attempt. But as Dr. Marwan said, you don't want to gamble with that. So the third, ch third chance is very, very important because that's especially for AFK because that's your gateway to dentistry. Um, I would pay very, very hard attention in when I'm going to go and if I'm ready to go to the exam or not. And um, I wouldn't mind studying for one cycle and then another cycle 
So um, extending the time that you study for is totally fine because um, even if you waste, it's not wasted. Even if you waited another six months, that uh, for you to pass this exam, that is totally worth it, right? So don't gamble with the third attempt. Um, study hard. So just dedicate the time, dedicate the effort, um, go through questions. So you are in a situation that you cannot gamble with anything. So you cannot, you have to study yourself. You have to depend on yourself. You have to go through articles. You have to go through books. You have to go through the mock exams. So you have to, you have to work hard on the third attempt. And if you did, you will pass. Definitely. There's a very good high possibility to pass in the AFK exam if you did well in the marks. If you did, if you pass the AFK, all our AFK marks, you have a very, very high chance that you will pass the actual AFK exam. You will score, you will score very high in the actual AFK exam. Um, um, we are, well, we're confident about that. That's something that we can say with confidence. I just want to add one more thing about the third attempt. We, I personally don't like when someone comes in a third attempt. The reason is because, and this is a human nature, nothing personal here. I always tell people do it once as if it's a third attempt. Whenever someone goes through failure, they become unrealistic. This is, we've seen it, I've seen it. And that's human nature. It's not you, it's not anybody, it's human nature. The first answer you're gonna have is why did I fail? The first answer usually, majority of people, they say it's not me. It's the NDEB conspiring against us. It is actually the center that did not do enough. No, I'm serious. That's the answer because that's usually how people think about the failure. They don't want to accept the failure, which is very tough, by the way, to go through. So that's why I tell people, please don't go through it because I don't want to deal with someone that also there is a psychological component now implemented where they're starting to become unrealistic. And when they become unrealistic, their way of reading the question changes because they start to read every question in a different way, looking for a trick, looking, where did I go wrong? And they start missing simple questions. So most of the people I see in third attempt, the way they read a simple question as if it's the trickiest question we've brought ever. And it's just a straightforward question because they went through two past experiences of failure. They don't think that it's as simple as it is. They believe this exam is actually so complicated and there is always something hidden I have to discover. So we face these people in the lecture hall and that's when like a question as simple as what's an indirect retainer on a Kennedy class one, they don't take it as simple as that. They come up with something, hypothetical scenarios, what if, what if, what if, they end up with totally wrong answer. And where do we see them on the statistics? Because I bring statistics with me to the exam, every option. There's always this 10% who chooses an option completely out of the blue. And a lot of these people are third attempt. And usually I tell these people, we people take it as a joke, but I tell them the question that comes to your mind first, this is not the answer. So cross that out and think in the other three, because this is what happens to them. And for those who attended the course was they see it because they start to feel that, oh, the exam was so tricky. Um, I knew the piece of information, but they actually bring two correct answers all the time. And we have to go through these two correct answers and it's impossible and it's luck and it's that and it's that. And they lose their confidence. They're not confident anymore. So we have to also reprogram ourselves that it's not like that. By the way, the majority, I wouldn't say the majority, but I would say maybe 60 to 70 percent of questions are very straightforward. If you know the information, it's very straightforward. There are some questions, clinical scenarios. Yes, you have to think a little bit about it. But I always tell people, by the way, the level of complexity I see in AFK, when people raise a, con a concern about a question, I don't even believe NDEB have the complexity of thinking that they can make something like that. So um, as you guys know, the course is around five months, and then we get around few weeks of a break and then we get another five months so in the course is not going to be updated only in this few weeks it updates throughout the course right throughout the course you will see that okay there's an update here we're sending you uh, slides you have to look at them so throughout the course we do update our our notes and then at the end of the course we just compile these and then put them in the new book so um, every cycle there is I would say around 10% updates in every topic 
or 10% overall in algorithmic targets. So if you waited for two cycles, I would say there's 20%. Some cycles we update, we do major updates in some cycles. So the, the latest major update that we did was um, ethics, epidemiology, basic science, perio, and restorative. So these are the major updates that we did implant as well. So if you have already been through these topics, you had already access to these topics, the updated topics, then that you have the topics. Uh, but yeah, the updates that we do is for every topic, we do a, an update and then we keep on updating them throughout the cycle. And then at the end, we do the final compilation of uh, the, the file itself. So you're planning to work two days a week? Yes, at a dental single? office, yes. Okay, so yeah, so that's like, it's different if it's, you had a family and other responsibilities. So your responsibility is only yourself? Yes. Or you have parents to take care of, or you have other families to take care it's of? Just, it's just me and the rent and the food, things yeah, like you that. Should, if, if, if it's two days part-time and selling, yeah, should be, you should be able to do it. That shouldn't be a problem. I, I disagree with that strongly. I think doing security guard is much better than assistant. You need something where you sit and you're just doing nothing and reading books. You know what I mean? And just watching who's entering and who's leaving and maybe doing a patrol every two hours. Assisting and hygiene, you go home, you need to sleep for 24 hours to recover from bending your back the whole day and dealing with a, a dentist who's pissed off, you know? So I don't recommend being in the dental field. It's very tiring. Do something where you're sitting behind the desk. Uh, thank you so much, doctors. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time for this session. So let's take a break. Thank you.